Now, after our first test, and we're skipping some chapters, we're going on to chapter 6, topic 1, real numbers, order, and absolute value. Well, the natural numbers are those numbers with which we count discrete objects. And that introduces our first set of numbers that are in the category real numbers. Now, we had mentioned this before. Uh, a synonym for this are the counting numbers. And it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, and then three dots. That is the ellipsis that indicates this pattern continues. And this is what we call roster notation. They called it listing notation. And that's OK, too. Now, if we add a zero to the whole number, uh, natural numbers, we get our next set of numbers, which are the whole numbers. Now, a good tool to illustrate these first two sets of numbers would be the number line. And I believe we did this before. So to indicate that you are placing them, in a sense graphing them, on a number line, you put a dot at 1, and these would be the natural numbers, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And once again, to indicate the ellipsis that this pattern goes on, we just thicken the arrow there. And that will go on to what is called positive infinity up there. Now, this was the natural numbers. To make it the set of whole numbers, all we do is add a zero. And now that's the set of whole numbers. Above, we showed how it's listed in roster notation. Now, if we extend this number line, then we end up with negative numbers and the opposite of a positive one is a negative one that is if you add them to each other it equals zero the opposite of two is a negative two the opposite of three is a negative three and so on and so forth and if by thickening this arrow, you bring this set of numbers out to a negative infinity out in this end, and these now are called integers. This is the set of numbers in the real number system that are the integers. So whole numbers and their opposite. Their opposite, when added to a whole number, is zero. And we see it illustrated here. So zero is the dividing line between positive numbers to the right and negative numbers to the left. Now zero is interesting because it has no sign. It is neither positive nor negative. And I believe we used that before. Also, we sometimes, if we're talking about terrain, and we have mountains and above sea level, sea level is considered zero. Below sea level, these are considered negative numbers. As you go away from zero, the negative numbers become larger. So uh, we have defined integers with again out in this area where negative infinity and then our listing or roster notation and positive infinity indicated by the ellipsis that the pattern continues. 
Now, we see part of a number line here. Are there other numbers on the number line? And yes, right here we see one half. And here is four thirds. Now, all of these numbers, and we think of them often as fractions, if they are converted to a decimal, such as one half is converted to 0 0.5, and one and a third, well, four thirds is one and one third, but we can think of it as four thirds. The decimal of that would be 1.3, and then the three would continue that is, repeat in a definite pattern, 33333. Three, 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 three. So we say all of the natural numbers, all of the whole numbers, all of the integers, and now these fractions, when they are put in fraction form, that they terminate, as we see in 0 0.5, or they repeat as we see in 1.3333, these are referred to as rational numbers. Now in just a moment we're going to introduce some other numbers on the number line. For instance, right here, that's the square root of 2. And then up over here, we have the square root of 15. And over here, we have the number pi. And we did mention the number e, and I think is about there. These, square root of 2, e, pi, square root of 15, when you convert them to numerical decimals, they don't terminate and they don't have a repeating pattern. And they just go on and on and on. So that type of number that doesn't terminate or repeat in its decimal form are considered the irrational numbers. And we'll get to those shortly. Something we did mention earlier was this notation this is set builder notation. Now, the book is intro introducing something here, and let me give a brief mathematical introduction as well. Now, this is to be a square, and we're looking at this diagonal of a square. Now, if this side is 1, and this side is 1, and if we use the Pythagorean theorem, and this side is unknown, let's say, and this would be like a side A, a side B, and the diagonal would be a side C, we could figure out what the length of this line is, and let's substitute. Uh, the rule is we have to square a, so a squared is a 1, b squared is a 1, so we have 1 plus 1, and if we take the square root of that, that equals what side c is. This is the formula. So the f length of this is the sum of these, which is the square root of 2 which I told you was 1.414, and it keeps going on and on and on. So here they're introducing another kind of number that is found on the number line, but it's not rational. Why? Because in its decimal form, it, ter it does not terminate or have a repeating pattern. So they're introducing this. And they're giving you a little more background on the Pythagorean theorem, and perhaps I should too. That if you have <laughs> a right triangle, and let's say this side is 
3 and this side is 4 then what would be the length of this which is called the hypotenuse part of the Pythagorean theorem and the hypotenuse is the letter C we said a squared plus b squared equals c squared so this side would be 5 and let's prove it so a squared is 9 plus uh, 4 squared is 16 and 5 squared is 25 and if you to add this up 25 equals 25 so this is true for all right triangles now this one was 1 this is 1 and when we did the math we got that side C was the square root of 2 or if we want to solve for C here we take the square root of this side that will give us C I'm just writing it on the other side and then we take the square root of that and this gives us the square root of uh, C squared first thinking ahead A squared plus b squared. There we go. And that's what they're showing us. So this gives rise to the next group, as we mentioned, the irrational numbers, which are described there. And all of these numbers that are on the number line are the real numbers. So x is such that x is a number that can be represented by a point on the number line and makes up the set of real numbers. So here they're giving you something we've mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a fraction. When we convert it to its decimal form, it's 0.4 terminates or fractions such as one-third in its decimal form has a repeating pattern. Here this is 272727. Two, two, so it then gives rise to a little illustration that uh, may be useful as you start to categorize numbers in the real number system. So, natural numbers, add zero, you get whole numbers. Whole numbers and their opposites, the negative integers, make up the integers. Integers and non-integers, which are the fractions that are divisible in their fraction form that terminate or repeat are the rational numbers then we have the irrational numbers, and all of them are real numbers. So another way of looking at it, another way of looking at it, and then some examples. So this should be included in your notes. So in example one, they want you to identify elements of a set of numbers. So here's the set we're working with we want to identify are they natural numbers, whole numbers, integers, rational, irrational, real. Well as we look at these all of them are real numbers. Now for the natural numbers we're looking for any counting number that would just be the five. So, five and real numbers. Now, for whole numbers, we would have to add the zero now, the five, and real numbers. Now, for integers, we'd have to add 
the negative 5. These would be the, and the real numbers, 0 and 5 also, are integers. Now for rational numbers, this would be everything except irrational numbers. And the only irrational that we have there is the square root of 2 is irrational. And then all of these are real numbers. Now again, you have to be careful of what they ask you here. They're not asking for which set do these numbers belong to. They're asking which is a specific set, which is a natural number. So for our 5 here, we wouldn't include the real number. 5 is the natural number. But natural numbers belong to the set real numbers. So you need to be careful of how you answer the question they're asking. Now in this example, if we think we have a number line, or we think we have one, there's one, and over here is zero, you might recall that we said anything to the right of zero is positive and anything to the left of zero is negative. So anything to the right of something, when you're asking for its order, and we use these symbols to indicate, uh, just to review, this is the equal sign, this is the less than sign, and this is the greater than sign. So, and again, we read generally from right from left to right. 8 is less than, let's try that again, 7 is less than 8. 8 is greater than 2. 8 is less than 15. Now, keep in mind that the point for it to be true is always toward the lesser side. Anything to the right is greater than anything to the left on the number line. And we had this one before, less than or equal to. And in a moment they're going to say greater than or equal to. Some of this is review. Now, we had said earlier that when we have something like this, 9 is greater than or equal to 5, we just have to have one part of it true. So 9 is greater than 5, therefore this relationship as is stated here is true. Now as we compare these numbers, again the statements uh, in solution form are all there, but Look at what they're saying. 6 does not equal 6. Well, this would be false. 5 is less than 19. That is true. 15 is less than or equal to 20. Part of it is true, so that's true. 25 is greater or equal to 30. This is not true, so that's false and 12 is greater or equal to 12. Part of this is true, so therefore it's true. Now, some more vocabulary. The additive inverse, or the opposite of something, is what we add to a number to make it zero. And then absolute value is an operation we do in mathematics we show we want to take the absolute value of something by writing uh, vertical lines uh, on either side of what we're going to be working with. 
Now, if we have 3 here, what is the absolute value of 3? Well, you count 1, 2, 3. It's 3 units from 0. So, z therefore, the absolute value of 3 is 3. You've counted 3 units. Now, for negative 3, suppose we're asking for the absolute value of negative 3. Well, negative 3 is there. What is the distance it is from 0? Well, you count. 1, 2, 3. It's 3 units. So, as a shortened form of definition, we say the absolute value of anything. Uh, my wife is calling me to lunch, but I'm back. So, once again, a couple of key terms. The additive inverse of any number is what you will add to it to make it zero. And the additive inverse of zero itself is zero. And the absolute value in general is once you do the calculation inside the absolute signs, it will always be its positive value. Now the exception is if it's zero. Zero is an unsigned number. And that's tricky sometimes. Okay, let's go on. So as we look at this, we're looking at something we had before when we have the negation of a negation it was just the value. So here we see it now in mathematics. We call it the double negative rule that the opposite of a negative 4 is 4. The opposite of a negative x is x. So we, you've often heard two negatives make a positive. And this is the rule. So a little background. Uh, the number is negative 4. The additive inverse is the opposite of negative 4, which is a positive 4. And of 0 is 0. 19 is negative 19. A negative 2 thirds, a positive 2 thirds. Now, when we take the absolute value again, we do what they ask us to do inside. And then when we come up with an answer, we take it out of the absolute value sign. And it's always the positive value, except in the case of 0. It's 0. So here we see the formal definition. The absolute value of anything is usually its positive value. The one exception is when it's zero. All right. Let's work on these together. The absolute value of 5 is 5. The absolute value of a negative 5 is 5. Now watch this carefully. The absolute value of 5 is 5. Then we apply the negative, and this is negative 5. Now, the absolute value of a negative 14 is 14. Then we apply the negative. Now, here they're asking us to do this function, which is 8 minus 2 is 6. So here it's the absolute value of 6 is 6. Here we do this function. It's 6, but now apply the negative. This one is negative 6. Perform any operation that appears inside the absolute value symbols before finding the absolute value. You do the operation inside here. Remember, the absolute values are grouping symbols. And what is grouped inside, if it's some sort of operation, addition, multiplication, whatever, you do that, then whatever the answer is, coming out of the absolute signs is always positive, unless it's zero. 
Here we're going to interpret sign numbers in a table. This is from the Consumer Price Index. And we're asked to which category in which year represents the greatest percent decrease. So this would be a negative number and we're looking for an answer. So the greatest negative change is this, negative 4.5. And that occurred between these years. Which category in which year represents the least change? So it would be the smallest value. So the least change looks like this one. Uh, a decrease of 0.4% in housing during this period of time. That would be the least change. So in example 5 we're going to compare occupational rates of change. And they're expecting between 2012 to 2022 these kinds of change. Now, which is showing the greatest amount of change? Well, the 48.8%. Which is showing the least amount of change? Well, here we're considered negative numbers as well. So the smallest negative value is this, 25.1. And by the way, these are accurate tables, so perhaps something you could keep in mind. And these are the answers. Okay, there are some exercises, and we'll be looking at some of these as part of our classwork. And of course, you'll be working on your new homework assignments and study plan as we prepare for our next test. Our next test actually is just going to be when we finish chapter 6. So we have three more topics to do in chapter 6. And this is more of the traditional mathematics.